From Microbe TV, this is Immune, episode number 28, recorded on February 7th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hello. Where How are you? Where it's snowing for you, right? It is snowing. I am stuck at home for one of the very few times that Cornell closes because we're getting about two inches an hour of snow today. Wow. Here's, yeah. Here it's raining. Lucky you. Also joining us, not from her usual location, today she's at She's in New Mexico, Steph Langle. <laughs> Hi there. Yes, I'm in Albuquerque right now. I was in Santa Fe just this morning, but uh, I've been lucky enough to come visit University of New Mexico with a special guest. Tell us who your guest is, Steph. Yes. So my guest is Irene Salinas, mm -hmm. and she is a associate professor uh, at the University of New Mexico. And I'll let her say her institute or her group, but it's the Department of Biology. And I'm really excited to have her. We honestly met uh, via Twitter. So welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. So you're in Albuquerque, right? Yes, I am. Must be beautiful. Must be, is it winter there? Must be cold, right? Yeah, it's cold. The mountains are full of snow and skies are blue and crisp and cold. And yeah, I love New Mexico. So <laughs> it, de it definitely was surprising when I was booking the conference in Santa Fe was a keystone and it was like, oh, New Mexico. Hey, that's going to be warm. But no. I think I <laughs> no, <laughs> it's very it's a little it's chilly cold. here, but it is cold, but it's beautiful. And um, it's been fun. I was lucky to speak at uh, Irene's lab meeting this morning. So thank you for having me there. Yeah, it was um, wonderful. And I guess I really wanted to have her on to learn about her background. She has a really wonderful research program in evolutionary biology and really mucosal antibodies uh, in fish and what we can learn for them uh, also in mammals. Let's hear about Irene's history. Yes. Because uh, you're, you're not from New Mexico, I know that. No, no, I'm from Spain. Um, and yeah, I've always loved fish uh, since I was very little. <laughs> Thanks to my dad who always took me uh, fishing and showed me how to dissect and clean the fish afterwards. So <laughs> from a very young age, I love fish. And then I, yeah, I studied uh, biology in Spain and went to the UK. I did my master's there uh, in applied fish biology. So I always had the kind of more applied, I guess, background, more focused on fish health for aquaculture. And that's what my PhD was on, probiotics. I did it also in Spain, fish probiotics and gut health. Um, and then I, after that, I did my postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And that's where we basically started all of our work on mucosal antibodies uh, in Telios fish. And then... Um, after another postdoc in New Zealand, I, I joined this department uh, at the University of New Mexico, and um, it's a great place to be. Uh, we had this center called the Center for Ev Evolutionary and Theoretical Immunology, SETI. It's an NIH uh, COBRE program. I don't know if you guys are familiar with po COBRE uh, programs. It's for um, poor states in the U.S. that are underfunded by NIH, that we have this IDEA program that funds us. And it allowed us to build this whole center for the last 15 years, uh, where we had a critical mass of people uh, looking at different aspects of evolutionary immunology, and also a lot of people from computer science and Los Alamos National Labs uh, all coming together in this very unique setting to just basically look at things about immune systems that most people aren't thinking about. So... Yeah, most of us uh, think about eating fish. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Eat, eating or uh, fly fishing. <laughs> so do you still fly fish? Yeah, no, I've always uh, angler. I've uh, been an angler right on the in the sea. I don't, I don't do rivers. I, I like uh, the marine. I like the marine fish to eat more than the freshwater <laughs> fish. <laughs> so uh, we uh, received just yesterday a paper that's going to be published. What tomorrow? I guess. Yeah, it's supposed to be today. They told us today, but I think it may be coming later today or tomorrow morning, yeah. So it's in Science Immunology, Specialization of Mucosal Immunoglobulins in Pathogen Control and Microbiota Homeostasis Occurred Early in Vertebrate Evolution. And a lot of authors on this paper, can you mm -hmm. t t tell us, are they all from your group or you have collaborators here? So uh, this is a long-standing collaborator with Dr. Sunier uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, who I did my postdoc with. And when I started my lab, I 
I started to work on completely different aspects of mucosal immunity. So my lab mostly works on nasal immunity and uh, nasal um, central nervous system uh, access against viral infections. So that's mostly what we do. But um, I've continued to uh, work with him for the last, I guess, six, seven years. And we've been uh, continuously funded by NIH to do this work. So, um, yeah, a lot of authors, because there has been um, working with non-model organisms like rainbow trout, uh, it's extremely hard. You need to develop all of your tools. You need to make all of your own antibodies. You yeah, need you to... can't just... Um... Right, go to yeah. No, you Afghan. cannot order anything from any from anywhere, <laughs> right. and so um, you know we need to make our own primers to look for each gene. Whenever we need to do, you know, just a qPCR, we need to look at the genome and develop the primers. And so anyway, um, it's been a six years of work and a brand new model that he's developed in his lab, in which we can basically in adulthood. So these are adult. Uh, rainbow trout that we can then deplete from mucosal antibodies uh, and then we let them restore over time. So it's a great model um, because it's very different from the usual mammalian models where they would basically have a genetic knockdown of uh, IgEs based on either, you know, you don't have PIGR or you don't have uh, aid so that there's no class switching. But in our case, this is happening in adulthood. And I think that's a great advantage uh, because we let this immune system develop properly and right. normally. Like it can actually develop with the developing microbiota as the fish age and then you're knocking it exactly. out in comparison to, you know, not understanding what a healthy gut looks like exactly. and then the perturbation, which Correct. is nice. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So Correct. Why, why fish? Tell us why you, you do that. Uh, so why fish in, in this particular case um, uh, is the... Great model because you guys can imagine uh, fish are all covered in mucus everywhere. So if you want to collect a lot of mucus, you just shake a fish in a bag and you will get it. <laughs> um, and it's true. And the immune system, very similar to the mammalian immune system with some differences that make it actually ideal to answer certain questions. So in the case of uh, bony fish, they do have B cells, T cells. Um, dedicated mucosal immunity and dedicated an uh, immunoglobulin and antibody that really resembles to IgA, mammalian IgA, but is not their, um, is not the ancestor of IgA if you look at phylogeny. It actually occurred by a, a process of convergent evolution. However, the features of this molecule are really, really similar to mammalian IgA. However, if you look at the mucosal surfaces of uh, fish, they don't have Payers patches and all of these organized structures that we have and they are make our immune system pretty complex. So everything happens uh, basically extra follicularly in the lamina propria or the epithelium of the gut, the gills, the skin. So we can really uh, understand a lot of biology related to mucosal antibodies that has, it gives us a much more, I guess, anatomically simple platform, uh, yet with the same analog, uh, analogs like the mucosal immunoglobulin, the same analogs, the presence of a microbiome, um, and many other different, uh, I guess, similarities that you guys can maybe ask me about. Uh, I don't want to give you a whole two hours on <laughs> fish, mu fish immunity because there's a lot of differences. <laughs> Do you have to, have to raise your own fish in tanks in the lab? Yeah, so we have uh, we have our wet lab downstairs here in biology. Uh, we have our rainbow trout system in there. Mm. Uh, we we get them. We can either get eggs or larvae from the farm, and then we just grow them in here. We can also have isogenic uh, trout that are made by other investigators. In in those, the genetic. Um, um, polymorphism and variation is much smaller. So, for instance, for repertoire studies, we used those uh, isogenic lines that um, have been used, for instance, for the genome, the rainbow trout genome mm -hmm. sequencing. So it helps a lot for B and T cell responses, for instance. But overall, we use out outbred fish from the fish farms. And it's great. It's cheap. We don't pay for them. <laughs> <laughs> we just How drive. big are they when you use them? Beautiful farm, which is drive there. So it really, of course, depends on the experiment. So for these experiments in this paper, because you can see our model is a, a depletion that is antibody-based depletion, is extremely expensive. <laughs> we need loads and That's loads so of much antibodies. Just like just bucket loads of antibody that yeah. is really expensive to make. So the smaller the fish, the easier it is in the sense that we are using less reagent. So we did a lot of different tests, and we, you know, we we ended up with this not, you know. Not not larvae, but uh, juveniles that were pretty small, maybe 10-gram fish. 
Mm. But it depends on what you want to do, right? So if you want to sort cells and you want loads of cells for cell sorting, we use, you know, half a kilo trout that allows us to get a lot of cells. Mm. So it's the beauty of it that you can choose, you know, whatever you need depending on your on your experiment. So that's great. You don't have that option in zebrafish, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> zebrafish are tiny, yes or yes. So. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's fun too because in Irene's office behind me there, uh, you can tell them the species, but there are two fish back here, African lungfish. Lungfish. Mm. Um, and they're just sitting, hanging out behind us, which is pretty cool. <laughs> they're alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, they're in a tank. Yep. Cool. <laughs> they're, they should be. They should be in an animal facility, but we are having construction at the moment because they are finishing the zebrafish room. So the bunker oh, was wow. the idea. So once. Yeah, so once we once we finish the zebrafish room, they will be back in their place. But for the time being, we wanted to be happy and quiet, so I have them behind me. That's cool. So they look kind of like an eel, huh? Yeah, the shape is like that, but you can see that the, the fins are not real fins. The fins are like our arms and legs. So they are our oh. ancestors. Wow. They can get out of the water and crawl in land, and that's why I study. Oh, cool. That is so cool. They don't so crawl out of your tank, though? <laughs> no, I have, we have the lid. We have the water. But if, if, we, if, we lower, if we lower the water, then they enter this oh process gosh. of estivation. This is one of the... Right. projects that we have and we are super excited about it because you know they can form these cocoons and they stay in the cocoon for like up to seven years is the longest they've been shown to stay there and there's this like store you know it's not full torpor but you know very low metabolism uh, metabolic rate and, and then when the the water comes back again they rain again the cocoon dissolves and they start swimming again so wow you all should look look up the cocoon of the african lung it is so cool so these so these are these are uh, on land then Right. Yeah, These that's a cocoon. Yeah. You nice. can see the mud surrounding them. So we just got a new project funded by NSF. We are starting this now. We are actually going to go to Africa to sample wild ones yeah. uh, out of the cocoon and look at the immu mucosal immune system of the cocoon. So Now, I guess we could talk more about so teleost um, and, and that as a model. But we could also talk, I mean, about the differences in IGT and IgM and, and the fact that they're very unique, that they do not class switch, which we, you know, we think in terms of mammalian biology as to why when you deplete IgA or PIGR, you have kind of this compensatory effect of IgM mm -hmm. um, it, that it, it does perturb the microbiota, but you can actually still protect against pathogens. But if you're to deplete IgT, you would not have this compensatory effect, no, correct? We don't, because okay. fish have aid, but they don't use aid for class switching, which wow. is extremely interesting. So they um, have aid. They have aid, uh, which undergo, you know, is involved in somatic hypermutation, and it's pretty cool because if you actually express teleost or bony fish aid into mammalian cell line, it will it will be able to be fully functional and you know. Or, you know, produce uh, all of the things that mammalian aid does. But in fish, it doesn't do class switching. So, mm. again, that was another of the strengths of our paper, the science immunology paper, is the fact that if we deplete IGT, then, then we can look at things without the effect of a class switch. And it was really interesting because we didn't see any compensatory changes in the levels of IgM or IgD, neither in mucus or in circulation. So those stay pretty stable. Mm. Mm. And, and I'm just curious in terms of, uh, well, you could, I guess, talk more about your paper, but there really does seem to be um, specification of where these antibodies go. So IgT is more in the mucosal and IgM is kind of your systemic where Correct. we think of IgA as the mucosal. IgG is the systemic, and of course we have you know different isotypes for different functions. Um, but is that because the B cells are migrating to those locations, or is it because they are secreted at their extrafollicular tissue and then they are being trafficked to those tissues? So that's a really good question, and this is one of the things that we still, I guess, we haven't completely figured out yet in the field. Uh, some uh, studies have shown that there's local proliferation of those uh, IGTB cells in those mucosal sites. So we know that is maybe probably some tissue environment that is allowing those cells to stay there. Uh, but of course, there's also IGT cells in the spleen or, you know, any of the other non-mucosal sites. So, um, yeah, still we don't know um, 
fully. And this model that we produced or we have uh, uh, incorporated or used in this paper actually could answer those questions because if you think about it, we have a way to get rid of all of those IGTV cells and then we know that by, you know, uh, 13 weeks later they restored completely. So if you wanted to, we haven't looked at it, but we now we could start looking at the spleen, the hematopoietic tissue which infaces the head kidneys, this anterior part of the kidney that is hidden in the, in the head. So that's the equivalent to the bone marrow. And that's where all of the hematopoietic uh, processes occur. So now using this model, if we really wanted to address the question, we would really have the chance to look at, you know, once they now regenerate, how are they then seeding again sure. mucosal oh, sites? So that's a, a cool, beautiful that's a project. Great yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, what we could do, I mean, you could share with us some of the information that's in this science immunology paper. And what I think I really enjoyed was learning about um, how it, the antibodies interacted with the microbiota. Mm -hmm. and how that changed um, and really then evolutionarily how that's very similar to the yeah. mammalian system. Total. Before you go into it, let me oh, ask you something. Yeah. You said in the introduction, mm -hmm. so IgA contributes to but is not essential for protection mm -hmm. of mucosal surfaces in people because patients with deficiency of IgA don't have increased susceptibility to respiratory and intestinal infections. And so I have always been taught that you know, mucosal Ig is essential for defense against respiratory and intestinal viruses anyway. So if this is true, um, what's going on? Is it that IgM takes over or? So what people have shown in uh, different studies using S deficient, uh, S IgA deficient patients mm -hmm. is that, yeah, there's a compensatory mechanism um, in humans. Uh, however, with regards to the microbiota, there's a still, I think the jury is still out because there's a lot of fight among the people working on this as per usual in science. <laughs> and I would say there's like two, <laughs> two schools of thought, if not two, um, I guess, labs. yeah, two labs <laughs> that are still saying, if we do this in a cohort from European as def deficient people, SIGA deficient patients, there is dysbiosis. If we use a cohort from the US or from somewhere else, there was no dysbiosis. So again, this controversy about like the essentiality, how essential it is, IGA, and whether or not yeah. compensation by IGM, I think there's a still a lot of debate, partially because, you know, sample sizes when you're doing human studies are not really large. Yeah, the sure. sampling is biased towards certain populations. Um, the ways you analyze the microbiome, I think that's also very critical. And I think we often... I think ignore that, but of course, you know, once you sequence microbiome, there's so many different, you know, caveats and just little, you know, things that people don't discuss, how you analyze the data, how you, you know, massage your data, how, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, of course, when you ask each, you know, when they ask each other, they say, oh, we use this other technique to sequence, the other sequence this other way, my cohort was different. Um, yeah. But so. Steph, <laughs> Steph, you have spent your career studying IGA, and you know its importance in defending, say, against respiratory pathogens, right? It is. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely is, um, and and rotavirus infections. Of course, I have not worked with, with the knockout model. I have seen that, um, you know, with certain pathogens, I don't, I don't think rotavirus, they've done that, but mm. it, it, it has protective effects. But I think that also can be because the microbiome is able to, you know, it, it has a lot to do with the gut permeability, and if you can get um, IG, you know, the dimeric, I'm sorry, the pentameric IgM to then enter the gut space in a, in a knockout model. So yeah, I mean, we know it's important. We know there are correlates of immune protection, but like Irene said, we're not looking at rotavirus infections in Absence IgA IG. knockout mm -hmm. human mm -hmm. cohorts. Yeah. And I think that's what you need. We can do it in mice all day long, but of course mice aren't the best model for rota. I guess we could do it in pigs. So I think it is, uh, yeah, very interesting. The jury is still out, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because there are many vaccines which we say don't work because IgA wanes quickly after mm -hmm. vaccination, mm -hmm. right? For sure. Um, you know, I think if you can get a more robust response in the germinal centers of the gut, it's, it is longer. Um, yeah. It, it doesn't wane as much, but uh, but yes, it's... Okay. So, Irene, why don't you walk us through in, in the paper and tell us, What's the question at the onset? 
So our question was basically based on the initial discovery that IGT, this T stands for teleost. Um, in you can also be or it can also be uh, named IGZ for zebrafish. So uh, <laughs> the people it was discovered at the same time oh, wait, in 2005 in the genomes of um, uh, zebrafish and trout. So two two different labs described it concomitantly, and then ever since then we were basically looking after the function of this molecule, and we knew from the beginning that at the molecular level there were some features that made it resemble a little bit more like IgA, but nothing was known. And that's what I did my postdoc uh, on back when, because now I'm an old person. Uh, but in 2010, we published that the function of this uh, IGT basically is a specialized in mucosal immunity. At the time, we didn't have a model to show this essentiality. Basically, what we showed at the time was if we take bacteria from the gut, we know that the majority of the bacteria are coated with IGT. That gave us a hint, okay, this is a mucosal IG. Um, we looked at infections that are mucosal pathogens. Um, and we knew that if we had an infection in the gut with a parasite, the majority of the antibodies against that specific, against that parasite, were always IgT. They were not IgM or IgD. Again, it was an infection model, um, again, not showing essentiality. So uh, since then... Uh, uh, we have discovered that this IGT is a panmucosal, um, I guess, immunoglobulin. So we move from the gut to other mucosal surfaces. Uh, and that was really interesting because, you know, we looked at the skin, which is mucosal in fish, not in mammals, of course. But, you know, it's this, the skin of fish is covered in mucus. And the same story was, again, IGT is always the prevalent uh, immunoglobulin there. We looked at gills. Uh, we've done it in my lab when I first discovered nasal immunity. We also discovered it in the nose. Uh, and so we are now pretty certain that this is, uh, uh, you know, a ubiquitously or a common theme in every single mucosal tissue of bony fish. And so, so I have a question. Yeah. I, I was wondering, so I was thinking about this, you know, you said the surface of the fish, the skin of the fish is a mucosal organ and it's bathed in this IGT. How stable is IGT? And is there measurable amounts of this always around in the waters where the fish live? So I don't think anybody has looked at levels in the water, but there's a lot of mucus shedding in the water. Mm -hmm. So one of the potentially, you know, there is definitely will be something there. And then the half-life of it is, of course, the problem. In our systems, we use recirculating systems. In other labs, they have open water systems where the water just goes in and out. So it obviously then varies a lot of how are you holding your fish that that mucus stays. You know, we, we change the water all the time in our fish. Uh, we change mm -hmm. it twice a day um, because trout like high oxygen water. So in our case, it's not staying there, but if you were thinking of a catfish or, you know, fish that live more in ponds where there's no much exchange of water, mm -hmm. there will be probably lots of this IGT uh, left over in the mucus that gets sloughed off and, you know, it stays in the water. Uh, but we don't really know the half-life, how long it lasts, right? So we haven't done those experiments yet. I'm assuming that it's similar to IGA where it decays pretty fast. But yeah, measurable, measurable levels in the skin at all times at the steady state. Um, um, I don't think anybody has measured the water levels. Hmm. And that makes sense why IGT is so high on the mucus of the skin, because there are a lot of parasites and bacteria that can affect the skin of, of these course. fish. And the gills, you and know, the gills, this, uh, yeah. Yeah. and the nose. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Trying to get in all the time. <laughs> <laughs> So, sorry, I forgot my... <laughs> where, oh, no. where were we? <laughs> no, you were fine. I, <laughs> where were we? I think we were talking about, um, you know, why looking at Tilios and, and kind of the history of IGT and then why you would want to study that um, in this model system oh, yeah, yeah. to look at like the, the microbiome or the mucosal oh, yeah, interaction. Yeah. Correct. So I guess since we, you know, my passion was a lot, uh, always this microbiome stories is something that I, we do in my lab all the time. And so it was, I guess, perfect that we kept developing this microbiome line of research in my lab. And then I kept collaborating with my um, ex-advisor at UPenn because he continued to develop, develop the model to deplete IGT while we were really interested in the microbiome aspects of it. And I think that since Synergism has really brought this paper um, uh, to, to the level where it is. And so in between, you know, those years, I guess many techniques have been developed. And I really want to highlight how much this has helped to the field of non-model, I guess, 
organisms and in particular immunology because now we have all of these sequencing techniques that we never used to have, right? And so now with all of these omics, we can do the same things that fancy people in the mammalian immunology <laughs> work do. And, you know, so we've taken advantage of um, what people had developed for IgA. Uh, you guys are familiar with this technique called IgA Seek, where uh, um, people, Noah, Noah Palm developed this few years ago, uh, and they basically just sorted bacteria that were coated with IgA. And then you go ahead and then you extract uh, the DNA from that and then you look at what species are there using 16S, 16S um, uh, RDNA sequencing. So we did the exact same thing with, with hard IgT antibodies. We sorted IgT coated bacteria or bacteria that were not coated by IgT. And then we're basically asking a very basic question is like, is this IgT targeting particular subsets of bacteria or is it just like a random, you know, is it just basically coating whatever? Um, and um, we clearly shown in this paper uh, that IET is coating very uh, specific subsets. About 30% of all of the diversity present in the in the gills was coated by IET. Mm -hmm. We just look at taxa in general or total number of OTUs. And then if we look at what was coated, we we, were, we found really uh, intriguing findings similar to what happens in IGA that both bad bacteria and good bacteria on paper were coated mm -hmm. by IET. So that has, happens also with IgA, and I think there's a lot of still to be known about that. But um, so yeah, so we did that. Um, are you guys? Do you guys have any questions about so the IgT seek? What is uh, the function of binding to these good and bad bacteria? So um, I guess the function in our case uh, we showed when we don't have that coating, when we don't have IGT coating, mm -hmm. that bacteria really translocated. So we have translocation uh, and dysbiosis. The bacteria get through the gills, the gut everywhere, uh, make it to the systemic circulation, and we have very high levels of LPS in the in the circulation of these animals. Uh, consequently, we have tissue damage. So the gills were damaged by the translocation. Uh, we had a uh, expression of pro-inflammatory cytokine markers like you would expect associated with the tissue damage. So mm. uh, not a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at functions of the coating, you know, it was curious because things that were coated by IGT uh, were shown to expand, but things that were not coated by IGT would may also expand when mm -hmm. we didn't have IGT. And this really uh, told us that there were both direct mechanisms and indirect mechanisms of microbiota control by this IGT molecule. And, you know, you can imagine there's a lot of bacterial-bacterial interactions that may happen there. So maybe if you now have a bacteria that is no longer coated, is allowing one that is not coated to maybe, you know, expand. Mm. And all of those different, I guess, possibilities that are complex, and we we've discussed on the paper, but they're just basically hypotheses, right? So, so it sounds to me like you could have a bacteria IgT biofilm that's holding everything in place, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was sort of wondering about. About because when we think about IgA, we think about it being trapped in the mucus layer. Mm -hmm. Right? Is it do you, uh, do the, so? These guys, even on the gill surfaces and so forth, they have. How thick is the mucus layer and can you see what's in those mucus layers? Because in when we think about the mouse gut, for example, there's there's two layers, right? There's a layer underneath that's high in antibodies and low in microbes. Yeah. And then in the further apart from the epithelial layer, it's high in microbes and low in back in the antibodies. And so they sort of keep this zone. Yes. Um, is it similar in fish? Um, this is a great question. I've wanted to do this experiment for a long, long time. Um, I need an uh, antibody for mucins if I want to be able to do that, and we don't have one. So those layers that you've described, the inner mucus layer and the outer mucus layer, uh, like you really well said, you know, they're basically, if you look at the original paper, they were discovered using an anti-mucin antibody that shows mm -hmm. where mucus is located and that way allows you to measure how thick the layer is, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, it's one thing that I was thinking last night is that I need to start making this mucin antibody. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you uh, have the fish, you have the fish technology, the inside to hybridization, right? And mm -hmm. so if you did the sections, you could see how far away the bacteria are from the bacteria, yeah, bacteria, yes. The bacteria, yes. Um, but that's also 
not so straightforward in fish. I think when we, mm. you know, this was not known a long, long time in mammals just because of how you fix the tissue. I don't know if you know the whole story about how right. you had yeah. to fix it, okay. et cetera, et cetera. And um, when we cut and we do this, things get moved around a little bit. So I'm not 100% sure that our mucosal layer hasn't been completely undisturbed when mm -hmm. we are doing in situ. Yeah. Um, and so that's the one thing that we should, um, yeah, we need to go back to it and just start testing different fixatives and see what doesn't disturb it and uh, get into the nitty gritty of measuring thickness and whether or not antimicrobial peptides are there. We know that for sure in fish. Um, right. Is, are they also zoned the same way as the mammalian gut where you have the high AMP level in the inner layer so do you prevent the contact of the bacteria? Yeah. It just occurred to me that you do fish and fish, right? Fluorescence yeah. inside to hybridization <laughs> and fish. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> wrote, giggling. I, I wrote I wrote a whole blog a few years ago because I went to a mammal, you know, the Mucosal Immunology Association. I went to this conference in Vancouver back in 20, 2013, I think it was, for a whole half an hour during my poster session talking about fish, skin of fish. And the guy half an hour later goes, Oh, you're talking about fish that swim. <laughs> I thought you were talking about <laughs> situ hybridization. <laughs> so your your comment is spot on. <laughs> so you so you mainly look at the skin in these studies, right? No, no, no. Uh, this paper, it was all on the gills. We okay. usually do everything in every mucosal tissue whenever we have these animals. And so now this paper is on the skin. Okay. Uh, we are working on the gut story right now. We, got it, we got have it. got this data in gut as well. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about the depletion aspect of this paper. The depletion aspect, like I said, um, is an antibody-based depletion. Uh, we don't actually know the biology of it, but we know that if we inject these animals with a cocktail of antibodies, these B cells basically die. It's just similar. Mm -hmm. It's a similar depletion that mammalian people have used, uh, but it's really efficient in fish, and we know that the peak of the depletion will happen three weeks after we give this cocktail of antibodies. This cocktail of antibodies was tricky to make. Uh, we have a diagram in the paper showing you, f you basically need, need to make make mouse anti-IGT antibodies. So what we did it was we injected mouse with purified trout IGT to make that monoclonal first, and then we do a second injection. But um, we actually don't know the mechanism by which these cells die, but we know they die. And uh, the depletion is very efficient. And the best part of all is that depletion was also efficient at mucosal sites because, you know, you can imagine you inject systemically. We were a bit worried about, oh, maybe it just depletes systemic B cells, but it depleted everything. So that was really good. Um, yeah. And that's uh, what my collaborator, my ex-advisor has been working on for a long time. And uh, now we got renewed this grant because we can also deplete for IgM, which is wonderful. And oh, we can okay. double, we can double deplete as well IgM oh, and IgT. So we have a lot of long, many, many years ahead of us <laughs> to look at what is happening in the microbiome when we don't have both of the Igs or when we only have IgM or IgT. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I thought what I thought was really interesting about your study is that once you depleted the IGTs, mm -hmm. then you started challenging them with a pathogen. So I think if I understood, the idea was questioning whether or not these IGTs were important for modulating the um, the natural microbiota or whether they might be important for pathogens Pathogen. that mm -hmm. would come in. And so it seems like in your study with the microbiota that you described that there are changes. And so clearly the IGTs are important for that aspect. But then you also did a challenge model and mm -hmm. you, um, can you describe that? Because I actually, as I read it, I was like, oh, oh, anybody who has a fish tank is going to be interested in this parasite, right? <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, so that was a fundamental question of this study, right? It's like, were these mucosal immunoglobulins this, this first appear because you needed to have a microbiota or they first appear because you have pathogens in, you know, every mucosal tissue trying to invade the host and you had to keep those pathogens away. And I think our experiments show that probably that function was acquired to do both things from the beginning in evolution. Uh, the pathogen challenge our model in this paper was what we call ick or white spot disease. And if anybody who has fish in their house in tanks just for fun, you have probably have these parasites. It shows as little white spots in the skin of your fish. You can see it by the naked eye. 
um, and they also infect the the nose. They also infect the gills, um, and it's a protozoan parasite. Um, and so this model is very well developed. We we know a lot about the biology of this parasite, and we also knew already that it elicits uh, very strong IgT specific IgT responses that are compartmentalized to the mucosal tissue. So um, so we knew that it was a great model. So because of that, we we basically just decided, uh, okay, let's get rid of IgT. And now we challenge with this ick parasite. We put the infective stage in the water. Uh, and then we have these really nice chronic infections. And then the fish, you know, take a few months to recover. But it was very obvious from our um, studies that, you know, fish that didn't have IET were dying quicker from this challenge and that the parasitic loads were also much higher as you would expect. So, well, I think, um, you know, wrapping up this paper, what I just really found interesting was how similar the IGT, uh, and IGA were in, in terms of the microbiome. But of course, what we learned is that IGT, there's no compensation um, for IgM. So I think when you start to do those double depletion studies, that's going to be really neat to try to parse out. The other thing that was interesting is that the shift in the microbiome to more firm acuities over bacteroides, um, is, that's the same as in mammals. of dysbiosis mm-hmm. in Correct. mammals, which I would not have guessed considering, I mean, totally different species. Correct. Uh, evolu- and evolution in terms of the bacteria host interaction. So, yeah. Um, so that's exciting. Yeah. It's yeah, very exciting. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Vincent. Um, I just wanted to ask is so you, th- you say you answered your question, which is probably IGA evolved or IGT evolved for both control of pathogens and microbiota. But are these ancient enough to answer that? Or is there anything more ancient than, than, than these fish that you're using? You could do it in um, sharks. Mm-hmm. Also have B cells and T cells, and they are a few million years older. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, rainbow trout is about three hundred and eighty million years. Sharks oh, okay. are four hundred and fifty, I think are, it is. Are there labs you know of that are currently working? But the problem in sharks, no problem. But we don't. Nobody has described a dedicated mucosal immunoglobulin in shark, and oh. this is something that people have been chasing for a long time. And I'm collaborating mm. with the experts in the field. Um, sharks don't have IGT. Um, they have others. They have IgNAR, which is unique to sharks. They have IG um, uh, M's, multiple IgMs, the 7S and the 19S, so the low molecular weight, high molecular weight. And then they have this IgW, which we thought that it would be the answer. So we've been doing this IgW just experiments forever, but we don't really have a clear answer. It doesn't seem that in sharks we have this kind of really um, biased mucosal Ig. So that's one thing that... Um, so far, it seems that our model is the one that is the most ancient, at least as as of now, to answer okay. this question. Okay. So. Got it. Got it. And I, I guess I wouldn't blame you if you didn't want to work on sharks. Yeah, it's <laughs> got to be hard to call, uh, grow them in the lab. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we buy them from fishermen, <laughs> and they are like super expensive. Oh, so you you buy. We them. get them alive. I go to Baltimore. Wow. <laughs> Uh, in my collaborator's lab and they pay fishermen to bring them live to the lab and it's a very expensive one sample, one animal experiment. <laughs> See, people at Whoa. the world have no idea. I mean, the, <laughs> amount, the amount of, you know, having to uh, just get to the field site to get the oh, samples yeah. is expensive and then, of course, the reagents. So it's just, yeah, whenever you see papers like this, I think to, to consider all of those aspects um, and just, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I mean, all science is a lot of work, but I think working in non-model systems, there's, I have a particular amount of respect for, because it definitely, um, introduces different kinds of challenges. For sure. Um, so I'm looking at the clock and I know we've been talking for about 40 minutes and you probably have like 15 more minutes, Mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. I really would love to transition. First of all, I'm glad we got to talk about that paper and uh, it's coming out today, tomorrow, but it will be out there for people to check out. Mm -hmm. Um, but you have also done some really interesting work with two different things, olfactory sensory neurons Mm -hmm. and modeling antiviral immune responses in your fish. And then the other story um, that we can talk about is nasal vaccination Mm -hmm. um, and how fish, I know you, you said that a lot of their, their B cell development is not happening in these, in these lymphoid structures in tissues. It's more happening, like you said, in the spleen and the head kidney, but there are some diffuse lymphoid um, yeah, tissues in the nasal. So with your time, I, I mean, if you want to talk about the, the, 
whatever you want to talk about, we can. Uh, we can do both. We can try to do both. That I leave it to you guys what you guys are more excited about. I'm really <laughs> excited about neuroimmunology because this is where my lab is focused at the moment. So well, these think... interactions between neurons and immune cells is what I'm really excited about. But I'm happy to talk about fish nasal vaccines, <laughs> fish vaccines in general, whatever you think your public is going to be more excited about. So Well, I think I, I would like to talk about what you're most excited about. So I, I think we could talk about, you know, the... Um, olfactory sensory neurons and and kind of the neuro immunology and modeling that. What what do you guys think? Do you agree? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay, so you're gonna ask me why do I do this in yeah. fish? <laughs> so I'm gonna tell you already the answer. Why do I care about neuroimmune interactions in fish? <laughs> because um, many of these fish pathogens always result in. Um, swimming abnormalities, a lot of behavioral abnormalities. So one thing that we always know about when a fish is sick is that fish are not behaving normally, right? That would be the same with us, with mouse, with anything, right? We we are not feeling well, we don't behave well. And so, but in fish in general, it's very easy because you see them swimming in the cages and they are not swimming normally. Mm -hmm. There's all of this whirling, they have a disease called whirling disease or disorders that they're scratching the side on the side of the tank. Uh, they are very lethargic, whatever. And however, we know very, very little about how infections affect the, the nervous system of fish. Um, my lab, uh, we discovered uh, in 2014 that fish have a nasal immune system that nobody had ever discovered before. And it's great, right, because it's merging or, I guess, uh, bringing these two sides. One is mucosal immunity, but also this neuroimmunology side where, you know, in the nose we have these direct contacts of neurons with the outside world, which is a very unique um I guess, uh, situation that also happens in our noses, right? Our noses have neurons that are in direct contact with the, with the outside world. And so, um, yeah, so in my lab, we are really excited about trying to understand how, when the nose detects a pathogen, how is that sending signals to the brain to then ba basically dictate both pathogen control and also behavior uh, in the long term. So uh, we are moving more towards the behavior side now. Our papers so far haven't had it, but we are definitely got some data now on that. Uh, and so um, you guys have questions about um, the model that we use. We use a rhabdoviral model, which you guys all care about rhabdoviruses because they infect us and they infect mice. They... I was going to say, Vincent, there's your viral yeah, connection. Yeah, exactly. Right? You, it's Vincent. Tremendous. You know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I've known... Uh, Fish rhabdoviruses are economically important, right? Very, very, very economically important all over the world. And when we think that we have them under control because we have a good vaccine, then oh, really? they come back again and there's a new strain that then is no longer, you know, our vaccine no longer mm -hmm. protects. Um, or we have an outbreak somewhere else in the world with a different serotype or a different. <laughs> so now this one that we work on, uh, IHMB, which stands for Infectious Hematopoietic Necrosis Virus, we, mm -hmm. we do have really great vaccines that were really good to control the outbreaks in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. that occurred in the 80s, 90s, mostly in the 90s, I think. And now all of a sudden we have new outbreaks and our vaccines are no longer good for these ones. Mm. Um, in mm. China, it's a disaster. They just have so many outbreaks for this IHMB and, you know, all of these strains are different from the ones we have. Wow. So they are I mean, now... really considering, I did not know that about <laughs> outbreaks in fish and they have African swine fever outbreaks in their swine population and now coronavirus. Mm. There's a lot going on over yeah. there for outbreak-wise. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, China and uh, vaccine. Yeah, they. I mean, good thing that they do have a lot of money for aquaculture and they do care about immunology. So there's a lot of people designing fish vaccines for these rhabdoviruses that are relevant for their region, right? But um, in our case, you know, it was a great model because we wanted to look at what happens in neurons and what happens on immune cells and how they talk to each other. And so a rhabdovirus, you guys know, it loves neurons. It has this neurotropism. And so this is exactly why we started to, to use this as a model. Um, and we knew from back 2014 that this is a great vaccine. When we put the vaccine in the nose, 100% of our fish are always protected from the challenge afterwards mm. because this vaccine delivery method is the most efficacious in fish for this particular pathogen. Um, and we think that is because of that synergistic activity between neurons and immune cells that works particularly well for a pathogen that is neurotropic. So, so this is administered intranasally, this vaccine? That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> in our lab, yes, that's what we do in my lab. In the field, um, uh, there are two different or there are a few different ways. In Canada, they have a DNA vaccine 
vaccine, so they do that intramuscularly. Mm. Um, Every fish is injected intramuscularly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or in um, or in this one, uh, people have done it IP, so intraperitoneally. Um, doesn't work that well for mucosal delivery. So the immersion vaccines and the so bath vaccination, oral vaccination, yeah. is the eternal problem, right? It's the same as in humans and in mice. We love mucosal vaccines when we try them, not as long lasting, not as a strong protection, except for our nasal vaccines, which are mucosal and they are even better than the injected ones. So mm -hmm. that's what I. Um, I want to advocate for is that our our nasal vaccination works really really well, and we have really exciting new data showing how long the protection is that we. Because in all of our studies, we've only done like one month challenges where we show, oh yeah, you know, we vac we vaccinate nasally, we challenge one month later, they are all protected. But if we wait six months or a year, they're also protected, and we are working on that paper right now. So, so that when you when you put the the vaccine in the intranasally does it just replicate in these olfactory neurons or other cells as well so uh, this vaccine we work with is a live attenuated vaccine and we can no longer detect the antigen four days later mm -hmm. so it doesn't replicate um um and we know that we can detect it in the tissue but we know exactly what cells mm -hmm. uh, within the tissue yet um we know we've looked at different areas of the nose and it seems to be a little bit everywhere. We haven't found one site of only antigen uptake. So um, so we are not sure about that. Yeah, but, so, but the idea is that the virus is somehow triggering these the olfactory neurons to make um, an antiviral response, right? Correct. Yeah. So in our uh, study last year uh, that we published in PNAS, we uh, show that um, the unique aspect of these immune responses in the nose is that they are faster than anybody had ever thought they could happen. Mm -hmm. So we... Mm -hmm. Uh, we were lucky enough to collaborate with an electrophysiologist and that was key to kind of look at these really short time points because in electrophysiology or if you're a physiologist, you care about what happens within seconds, right, in neurons. In immunology, we're always thinking the earliest in hours, right? Like we don't think about sampling after okay. we give a virus within minutes, right? Like we're like, oh, I mean, I'm waiting a mm -hmm. few hours for cytokines to be, you know, to be turned on and, you know. So uh, we started to like narrow down, you know, we would do one day after the virus and then we'll go to like four hours after the virus and then one hour after the virus and my friend is like no still too late you need to like look earlier and earlier and we we do it we've done it as early as we could possibly do it because of the sampling and the fastest we can do it is 15 minutes if we want to sample 12 fish or so so six from each treatment we can vaccinate and within 15 minutes we can isolate the nose and look at what has happened and what has happened is that there's a particular type of neurons in fish called creep neurons that enter apoptosis really quickly once we give the this virus because they express a specific receptor called track a and track a field is huge it's you know many people work on this receptor because many pathogens are uh, hijack this receptor um, in our nervous system even in in mammals and so these neurons enter apoptosis really fast um, and then um, it activates further downstream it activates electrically other neurons uh, which send really quick signals to the olfactory wall, which is what I'm really interested in understanding is how the nose sends signals to the central nervous system, even when the pathogen was never reaching the central nervous system, which right. is the beauty of our model. Because many people in mice have looked at, oh, what's the olfactory bulb doing when we have an infection in the olfactory bulb, right? That's what happens. Of course, there's going to be a response because you have a pathogen doing damage in that tissue. But what we've shown for the first time is that we are having immune responses in the brain that are happening to just the fact that our olfactory sensory neurons were detecting the pathogen in the periphery, you know, in the periphery, in this case, the nose. So That's amazing. And so that, that detection, that rapid response, you say re end up recruiting CD8 alpha cells, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. CD8 T cells. Within minutes. Minutes. Amazing. It's amazing. Wow. It's amazing. And and where were they coming from? So they're coming from the CNS. They're coming from the olfactory bulb, and this oh, was okay. extremely hard experiment to do <laughs> uh, because you can imagine the olfactory bulb in a trout is tiny. And we did this experiment, I remember, a whole summer. I think my poor PA, first PhD student did this, I don't know, 10, 12 times. I really desperately needed the preliminary data for the NSF grant. <laughs> and uh, in the end, we actually figured out that it was not just taking 
the olfactory bulb, we needed to collect all of the vessels. So we lifted the olfactory bulb out and there was all of these vessels that were surrounding this microvasculature that was surrounding the olfactory mm. bulb. So if then we added a drop of media and collected those micro vessels that were left over in that little socket left when we removed the bulb, sure. then we could detect that those cells were living from there. Oh, that's wild. And so... Mm -hmm. After the 10 or 12th time and, and just, it, were you sitting in bed one night or in the shower and you're just thinking, okay, let's just see what, what's the residual, what yeah. that microvascular, yeah. was that kind of how that happened? Yeah, yeah. I don't sleep much at night. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking a lot of, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I do a lot of uh, visionary experiments in my bed when I'm laying down. But uh, he repeated, he repeated it four times and we were 100% sure that that's where they're coming from. Okay. And uh, actually, um, this paper was under review in a, you know, even higher impact factor journal forever. Mm -hmm. um, and they asked us to actually identify where they were coming from by microscopy. We tried really hard in trial to get it done and we couldn't just because our antibody, that CD8 mm -hmm. antibody, wouldn't uh, react when we actually process the tissue in any way that we could section. But the beauty of Cibrofis, which is what we are doing right now, is that you have amazing tools for imaging. Yes. So I'm really excited to say that soon we're going to have a really amazing paper where we have actually looked located where and how this like CDA center are. of these T cells is in the olfactory bulb. Wow. I mean, it, it exists. We've seen it. You've seen it. Okay. Now I've seen it. It's no flow Great cytometry. News. It's not a fax plot. Just we've seen it. Okay. <laughs> well, that's, no, that's exciting. I mean, and I, looking at this paper, uh, is there, um, so the crypt neurons, you said that's in fish, but are there homologs? I mean, do we have crypt neurons? So we don't have crypt neurons, but these crypt neurons really, really remi remind me of tuft cells. And I don't mm -hmm. know if you guys have heard about tuft mm -hmm. cells, yeah. Yeah. Sure. which sure. recently, a few months ago, have now described in really large numbers in the nose of humans with rhinosinusitis. Wow. Huh. Um, really similar morphology, shape, um, some of the markers they express, how they behave. So I have just been in a conference recently where, yeah, some people working off tough cells that now that they've covered them in the nose, maybe looking at these apoptotic pathways in tough cells. Wow. So uh, not the exact same, but again, maybe convergent evolution that oh, we sure. do have, you know, similar cells that are kind of like, I call them the canary, you know, it's kind of like the canary on the mind. They are the first ones to respond. And the creep cells are, okay. I think they were okay to die just because there are such a small numbers in fish, you know, in the fish nose is such a small proportion of them that probably the effects in terms of the neurosensory function of the fish are minimal but yet it's allowing this really rapid immune system to be turned on so you don't really want 40 percent of all of your neurons to die because you have a virus in there yeah. but if only 0 0.1 or, or 0 0.5 percent have died i think maybe that price was okay to pay for sure and then if you have cd8 t cells recruited within exactly. seconds exactly then you can provide exactly. protection exactly exactly right. yeah mm -hmm. I, there, you have a section in this paper. Love the title, Rainbow Trout Smell Neurotropic Virus. Yes, <laughs> it is. That's what one of the major parts of our paper. I mean, Great. it's amazing. It's amazing. I thought, yeah, right here. It is. <laughs> they can smell them because we've shown that electrophysiologically, yeah, neurons get activated. Right, so, right. Yep. Wow. Well, that's great. Well, I'm keeping cognizant of the time yes. here. Uh, do we have any kind of burning questions? I know we could talk all day. I mean, this is really exciting stuff uh, that I, I re why I enjoy it is because really we can learn a lot about basic immunology, but then there's a lot of uh, applications in terms of um, antivirals. I mean, I'm thinking fish, but of course I think this could be applied to other species and then vaccines mm -hmm. as well, like right. our canonical vaccines. Mm -hmm. So, so you guys have any I, I think a, an important point needs to be made, and that is, I, I, you know, I don't, I love viruses, but I don't follow much of what goes on in fish. But now, having read Irene's work, I, I will be because I think you can learn a lot and get yeah. ideas about mammalian systems. So this has been great. Yeah, Thank you, Vince. <laughs> I agree. I you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm always fascinated by the evolutionary immunology stuff, and so looking back at what these primitive uh, animals have for immune systems and how they are so similar in some ways to what we have, I think is fascinating. 
Mm, yeah. yeah, that's why we do it. I mean, 99% of the people are looking at the same species. So yeah. you always have to have some of the crazy ones like <laughs> us who take want to take risks. And so fight. so how, how advanced are the genetic manipulation technologies for fish? So has anybody tried to CRISPR things out yeah. to start to do mm-hmm. things like they do in mice? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. CRISPR, you know, very well developed in zebrafish, as you probably know. Yes. People have done it in salmon. Um, so salmon, you know, salmon trout is tricky just because of the tetraploidy. So whenever you want to knock something out, there's always three other genes oh that are gosh. very similar. <laughs> yes. huh. so you have paralogs and you have, and especially in the immune system, that's the one thing that drives us nuts. Uh-huh. Uh, so in zebrafish, it's not tetraploid, so you will have a couple of copies, but in trout, you always have four of the same, if not eight. Yeah. So then, you know, CRISPR, you need to really know which one you want to get out if you're really sure about the function, because otherwise you may have compensation, right, from another really similar one. So I think that's the biggest caveat um, for it, but it does work, right? Like you can do it. Yeah, I hadn't realized that. That's interesting. Yep. Yeah, the two rounds of genome duplication is our <laughs> biggest enemy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, should we wrap up, Steph? Yeah, yeah, I think that that would be great. Um, All right, this is episode 28 of Immune. You can find Immune on any podcast player. If you do listen, we like you to subscribe so we know how many people are listening. And if you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute for ways that you can help and of course questions and comments immune at microbe.tv our guest today from university of new mexico in albuquerque irene salinas thank you for joining us thank you so much for having me it was it was a pleasure really great stuff um wish i do wish we had more time but uh what i hope our listeners love it well, listen, we'll have her back. Yeah, I think we can come back, it, yeah. It sounds like there's a lot more coming out then and more to talk about. Totally. So we'll, we'll do it again. <laughs> would love to. Cindy Leifer's at Cornell University. She is Cindy Leifer on Twitter. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Going to go out and plow the snow? No, uh, I got to go shovel. <laughs> <laughs> Steph Langle's at Duke University on Twitter. Stephanie Langle. Thanks, Steph. Yes, thanks. It's a lot of fun. When are you coming home? I fly out this afternoon, so I'll be wow. home late tonight and uh, then can think about, you know, get back in the lab. Thanks My for, boss would be happy about that. Thanks for arranging this, Steph. Oh, yeah, sure thing. Sure thing. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month.